Um, yeah. Yeah. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for May's second uh, stats seminar, toolbox seminar. Uh, today we have Rez Altwell talking to us about model inference, model selection, and model averaging. Rez currently heads up the Center for Statistics in Ecology, Environment, and Conservation, or SEEK, at UCT. Rez has a broad interest in statistical ecology, including population including population ecology, wildlife, demography, and micro macroecology. Uh, I'll now hand over to Rez to get the talk started. Thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, so as Craig said, today we are going to talk about multimodal inference. Um, so when you're dealing with an analysis of a real data set, you almost always have options for a number of different statistical models that you could potentially fit. And the question is, how do you how do you decide which model you should go with? Um, and, and so we are already right there in the space of model selection, comparing between models and, and perhaps basing inference on, on several models at once. So here's a brief overview of, of my talk today. Um, so we are first going to look at um, how we are going to rank a set of models. So how do we decide which model is better than another model that we are considering? And um, so, so it's going to be about what is a good model and, and how do we compare models? And then we are going to talk about how model selection fits in with the idea of having multiple working hypotheses. So these are multiple scientific hypotheses that you want to test and how does model selection help us with that. And then finally, we're going to explore the idea that maybe we don't have to base our inference on just a single model. Maybe we can we can use our entire model set or, or several models to draw inference. Um, okay, so what is a good statistical model? A good statistical model should fit the structure in the data, but not the noise in the data. So we have two problems that we need to consider. The first is underfitting. So that would be that the model is fails to fit the structure of the data. Um, so we, we get biased predictions and, uh, and generally a poor description of the models of the, of the structure that we want to explore. The other problem is overfitting. So that happens if you fit a model that's way too complex for your data. And so that model is going to fit to the noise and uh, we lose precision. So, so that means if we, if we had another data set that which was generated by the same process, the model would give quite different answers. And, and, and that's a hallmark of overfitting. So I'm going to demonstrate these two problems with a quick example here. This is a data set that I received from Chris Oosthuizen. It's about elephant seals on Marin Island. And uh, you can see here, we're looking at weaning mass of seal pups in relation to the mother's age. And you can see the youngest mothers were three, year or three years old and the oldest mother was 19 years old. And you can see that um, it looks like weaning mass tends to increase with age. Um, and, and that's indeed the question, how is weaning mass related to model's age? And, and so we are going to fit a few models to this data set. Okay, so here's something we could do. And um, you might have noticed, so this data set is actually looks a little bit different. It's a, a simulated data set. And, um, and I simulated the data set so that we can see what would happen if we fitted the same model to to different data sets that come from the same process. The advantage of simulating data is that you know what the data generating process is. Okay, so here on the left-hand side, I fitted just a simple linear regression model. So that uh, should be familiar to you. We've gotten uh, three parameters, an intercept, a slope, and then the residual variance. You can see here um, the the confidence interval is relatively narrow around this regression slope. But also if you look at the model fit and the, and the prediction. So here we are over predicting. So the line is for, for young models, the line is going to go, is going through the highest values rather than sort of a more typical value. And the residuals are all negative. Then 
uh, we have a sort of an area of middle-aged females where the residuals are all positive. And then for very old females, again, the residuals tend to be negative. So we are over predicting. So this is a very simple model. It only have, has three parameters, but, and, and it gives us very precise sort of predictions, but uh, you can see that they are biased for most of the part in various ways. And then on the right hand side, I fitted age as a factor. So in this model, I'm actually using 18 parameters and you can see here, the fit model sort of predicts the mean uh, exactly for each class, for each age class. So this is a far more complicated model and you can see the confidence interval is wider. So our predictions are less precise. Um, and then also we've got these wriggles in, in the, um, the sort of in the line. So for example, do we really believe that models of age nine, um, that those pups have a, a lower weaning mass than either eight or 10? Probably not. So this is probably fitting to noise in the data. And I'm going to show you, um, so I want you to keep your eyes on these fitted lines. So here, it's another simulation, just another simulated data set from the same process. And you can see if I go back and forth a few times, you can see the linear regression model here um, wriggles a little bit, but the line for the for this model here, which is far more complicated, actually changes quite a bit. So we don't have that dip anymore at age nine. We've got other sort of structures. And then if I, if I uh, simulate yet another data set, you can see we have yet again different results. Okay, so this actually on the right hand side, the, um, the change sort of in, in the predictions and and, and the, the wide confidence interval is a, a hallmark of overfitting. And on the left hand side, we have underfitting. So this model produces biased predictions for the most part. Okay, so it turns out that there is a trade-off between bias and variance, and it, it's in relation to model complexity. So if we have a very simple model, uh, it, it gives us very precise parameter estimates because we have a lot of data to estimate each parameter, but uh, it tends to be, it tends to be biased um, if, if it doesn't capture the structure in, in the data very well. Now, if we increase model complexity, um, bias tends to decrease because a more complex model can fit the data ever more closely, ever more precisely. It, it fits to, it, it can fit to more complex structures, but the variance also increases. And then ultimately, you know, if we have a model that has as many parameters as data points, we can fit the data exactly, but we lose all ability to predict anything from it. So what we really want is we want to, to select a model that balances that trade-off between bias and variance and is sort of, of intermediate complexity for a given data set. Uh, one criterion that helps us do that is archaic information criterion. Um, there are others I should say right now, but in this talk, I'm just going to uh, use AIC because AIC has quite deep foundations, theoretical foundations in information theory, and it's very widely used, but it, it's by no means the only criterion you could use. Um, and, and, and there are definitely other others that are good. Okay, but let's use AIC for today and let's look at what AIC does. So AIC is calculated as minus two times the log likelihood. So this is the maximum of the, the maximized likelihood function here given the model and parameters plus two times the number of parameters. So this part here, um, minus two log likelihood, it's also sometimes called the deviance and you can think of it as a measure of fit. So if, um, if the deviance is large, your model is not fitting the data very closely. If the, the smaller dot deviance, the more closely it fits the data. And then this here, you can think of um, as a penalty term in a sense. Uh, so a more complex model will make AIC bigger um, because we need more parameters. Uh, and, and likewise, so, so you can see the two parts. So 
poor a poor fitting model and a big big model will both increase AIC. So it turns out that AIC is um, is a, a criterion that uh, that can help us pick the model that best balances bias and variance, and uh, you can see a smaller value is better. So we want a close fit to the data, and we want a relative small, relatively small model. Okay, so here um, I'm showing you the real data set again, not the simulated data, and I fitted those two models that I showed you earlier to the real data set here, and you can see um, the model that we earlier said is, is maybe a little bit too complex for this data set. Actually, sometimes some of these parameter estimates are based on a single observation. And then I also fitted a third model, so this is a nonlinear saturating curve and you can see the model here. Uh, it's only got three parameters, beta naught, beta one and uh, the variance of the residuals and but it seems to be capturing the structure of the data a lot better. Okay so uh, let's calculate AIC for all of these. So we've got AIC is really just calculated from two numbers. It's really straightforward to calculate by hand or in a spreadsheet or in R, whatever you want. And, um, and obviously very often you, you get AIC values um, in the output of, of um, functions that you are using to fit models. So, um, so here are the deviances or minus two log likelihood. Um, you can see here, the most complex model is that model M2. And you can see that it has the lowest value for minus two log likelihood. So that means what we are seeing here is that this model fits the data the closest. So it's able to sort of wriggle and fit um, as, uh, quite, quite a bit more closely than the other two models because it has a more flexible structure. But uh, it needs a lot of parameters. And we saw here this was a very simple model, just three parameters, uh, and it doesn't fit the data very well. So it has a, a large deviance, uh, the largest of all of them. Uh, and then the third model here is also fairly simple, but it fits the data, it, it fits the data more closely than the first model. So you can see the deviance here, it's larger than the, the, the big model, but it's clearly smaller than the first model. And when we calculate the AIC, we can see that the third model here has the lowest AIC. Um, okay. And, and, and as we would expect, sort of the first model with a poor fit has got the highest AIC. So that means, out of these three models, the third model here is the best because it uh, it has the lowest AIC. It best balances the trade-off between um, between bias and and, uh, and variance between overfitting and underfitting. Okay, so now it turns out that these actual these absolute AIC values aren't stop meaningful. So they depend on the exact data set. Um, and all that matters is in fact the difference between those AIC values. So these, these values here can range from negative values to very large positive values and it doesn't really matter what the absolute value is, all that matters is the difference in AIC between different models. So therefore it's often convenient to just calculate the the difference between those AIC values. So you take the best one, give it a zero, and then uh, these are just the differences to the best model. So you can see here model two was 6.65 points um, worse than the best model and model M1 was 49 um, value uh, uh, points worse than the best. So these are absolute differences. So think of it as, um, as a, like, um, a race and you, you really want to see how how many seconds or minutes the, the best runner is ahead of the others. So that's really very much the same principle. So you just worry about how many minutes or how many seconds. So this is a sort of a, um, a, 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 cons a, a difference that matters. And, and um, for example, 49, a difference of 49 is always very large, no matter what the AIC values are. Um, and as a rule of thumb, if you have a, a model that's maybe within about two 
um, of the best value, then those are fairly competitive models. Okay, so we've now looked at the difference in AIC and um, here um, introducing RKQ weights. So this is another way of measuring how much better one model is than another. And, um, and it's calculated from those delta AICs, from those differences in AIC values. Uh, so this might look a bit daunting at, at first, but uh, it's really just e raised to the power of minus uh, a half the delta AIC value for a particular model. And then it's sort of standardized by the sum of all of them. And so that means our AIC weights add up to one. And the best model here has the highest AIC weight. Um, and then those weights get increasingly smaller. So they are never actually exactly zero. This is just a rounding, um, yeah, a rounding issue here, but um, you can see how they get smaller. And um, the interpretation of these AIC weights is uh, that model in this case here, model M3 had 97% of the support uh, from the data relative to the other models. So we can see here um, that there's quite an overwhelming amount of evidence that model M3 here is the best one. So uh, an alternative way to think about this, it is if you, if you, if you collected not a data set that was generated by the same underlying process, you, you would have 97% uh, chance of, of selecting model M3 again as the best model. Okay, and then from these Akariki weights, we can calculate evidence ratios. Um, so for example, so this is now a pairwise comparison. Before we were comparing the entire model set, um, all the models at the same time against each other. Now we are comparing pairs. So that's also sometimes useful. So you can say how much better is model M3 compared to the second best one. And that's just the ratio of the AIC weights. Uh, and, and so the answer here is model M3 was about 28 times more likely to be the best than model M2. Okay, so this is a bit, um, so, so you can think of if, if two, if one model is maybe just twice as good as the second best, uh, you don't, you have le much less strong evidence for that model to be the best. But in this case, we have a, a very good, um, yeah, very strong evidence. Okay, and here, this is just again, uh, showing you the fitted models. I don't think I wanted to say much more about it. Okay, so then, um, we, we come to the next part of this presentation. Um, so model selection analyses are often used in, in two very different uh, approaches. So the first approach is the hypothesis-based research. So this is really what, what, you are, what I'm hoping you're doing most of the time. You're going out to collect data because you have certain ideas about how things should be working and you want to test those ideas. So this is hypothesis-based research. Uh, you've, you've got certain reasons for collecting the data you did and you want to test those hypotheses, even if maybe they are, the hypotheses aren't spelled out very carefully always, but that's really the idea. And then the other, sort of area of application is data mining or hypothesis generation. So this is, you, you just get the heap of data and you're looking for pattern. So um, so I'm in, in this talk here, I'm assuming you want to do hypothesis based research. And, um, and the important point here is that you can always, if you've got the data set and you've got some hypotheses, you can first do your hypothesis, uh, test your hypotheses, um, basically confront your hypotheses with the data and get uh, an answer from the data on which hypothesis is the most likely given your data. And then once that's done, you can still do data mining. You can do with the data, whatever you want. But what you can't do is you can't do it the other way around. So if you, if you collect data and you, you go through a data mining exercise, um, you cannot use those same data to test hypotheses that were generated this way. That would be using the data twice 
and and not actually scientific misconduct and um and it's quite unfortunate a lot of people don't seem to realize how bad it is and uh, and so, so once you know, if, if you if you see a paper where someone has been clearly doing a data mining exercise and then come up with some hypotheses, this is just this is just not correct. So you you cannot test hypotheses that you generated by looking at the same data set. Okay, so 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 be very careful about that. First, think about the hypotheses and test those, and then you can do whatever else you want. Okay, so I'm assuming you want to do you want to do hypothesis-driven research. So here are the steps. Uh, first, you need to come up with a set of biological hypotheses, and that's really often the most difficult part. So you've got to think really carefully about what are you expecting, why do you want to do a certain piece of research, um, why do you want to collect this data set. And then you translate these hypotheses into statistical models, and then you collect your data. That could be um, f an experiment. You go to the field, you collect observations. It could be an observational study. Um, okay, so this is sort of the ideal process. I realize often uh, it doesn't happen in this sequence, but the important bit is that you have your hypothesis ready and translated them to models before you've looked at the data. So you might have collected your data already, but it's important that you don't mine your data for patterns and then um, generate your hypothesis based on those pat patterns because that would be wrong. So you do have to first think about the hypotheses. Okay, so then you fit the models to these data, you evaluate the relative support each model has for the data. And so in this case, remember each model now corresponds to one of your hypotheses. And then you you, you can use that to answer your questions. And um, we're again going to go through an example of this. Uh, so this tree here is an acacia karoo, a sweet thorn. And uh, these trees are uh, are expanding across South Africa, so they are part of bush encroachment, and so uh, so there's been some interest in knowing whether part of that, that bush encroachment and growth of these trees are maybe is related to the increased level of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so let's let's assume we've got that hypothesis. We want to explore how plant height. Uh, depends on CO2 concentration. We are going to do a, a controlled experiment where we are going to raise saplings on the different levels of CO2 concentration and then um, and then measure plant height after a certain time. Okay, so if you think about these hypotheses, um, so one hypothesis might be, well, there's no effect. Uh, these plants just grow at sort of the same speed to the same height, irrespective of what level of CO2 we have. So that would be, uh, you could talk, you could call this maybe a, a null hypothesis, or maybe the, you know, skeptic wouldn't, yeah, would think, well, it has no effect. There are many reasons why you could think so. Um, then another hypothesis is that if I increase CO2, the plant is going to grow increasingly higher. Okay, so um, so there's a linear relationship between plant height at a certain point and CO2 concentration. Then uh, yet another hypothesis could be that yes, um, plant height, so growth increases with CO2, but it levels off at some point because maybe other factors become limiting. And then you could even have a hypothesis that says, well, maybe too much CO2 is bad for the plants. I'm actually not an ecophysiologist, so, uh, so just treat this as an example. Right, but you, you get my point. So then um, once you've got your hypotheses, you translate them into statistical models. And in this case, it's fairly straightforward. So here we are, we're going to fit um, linear models for some of these. In this case here, it's an intercept only model. So we just say plant height y, uh, the response is constant. Then this is a, a linear regression model here, basically. So we say uh, we've, we're going to estimate an intercept and a slope. I'm uh, going to fit the linear relationship. And then I'm just going to jump to this one. So here we could just add a quadratic term and that would allow the model to go down towards the end. And then here 
um, using a nonlinear model similar to what we saw in the seal example. Okay, so I've chosen my models. Now we need to collect the data. And uh, it turns out that uh, Barney Kogopi for his PhD at Zambi, he he did exactly this kind of experiment. And, and it was published more than a decade ago now in Austral Ecology. So this is not Barney, this is Derek, who's also not a scientist there in the climate change group at Zambi. But what they did was they raised um, they raised acacia saplings in, in those CO2 chambers where they could control the CO2 concentration. And here are the real data taken from the paper. Uh, so you can see here plant height after a certain amount of time. And they their treatments were, I think it was 200 or 180 ppm. Uh, and then they raised those, um, yeah, they raised saplings or seedlings on the different concentrations up to a thousand ppm. And each data point here is one replicate. So this is one experimental unit. Um, and you can see we had, um, I think it was a balanced experiment, four replicates per treatment. Okay, so we've got the data. We need to fit the models to the data. So this is very simple. You can use function LM for the linear models and NLS for the nonlinear model. So here are the best fitting lines for these four models. Right, so now we fitted four models and each of them corresponds to a hypothesis, a biological hypothesis. So now we want to know which of these models or by um, extension, which of, of, uh, which of these hypotheses is best supported by the data. Okay, so I'm not going to show you a lot of code today. It's really much more about concepts, um, but what I want to point out is that the calculations that, I'm, that I've used for these things are really quite straightforward and, um, and are, are really easy to do in just a few lines of code. Um, and there, there are also functions in R that directly do, uh, you know, maybe create nice model selection tables, do all the calculations for you. But I'm a, a big advocate of coding, uh, you know, at least when you do this for the first time, um, write your own code because it really helps you understand what the calculations are and, and it helps you check that the, what, what the more fancy function returns to you that that's actually correct. So if the calculations are relatively easy, I am a, a, a big sort of advocate of doing the calculations yourself rather than relying on a on a, a on a, a, a function that's sort of ready off the shelf. You can still use that function later. It can save you time, but uh, it's important to see that um, that you use you, you that you understand what's going on. Okay, so. Um, in any case, the code that I showed you on the last slide produces a model selection table, and that's the usual way of presenting the results of a model selection analysis. So we've got minus two log likelihoods. So remember that's a measure of how closely the model fits to the data. To the data. You can see that first model here, which was an intercept only, fits very poorly. And then we've got some better fit here with the more complex models down here. And then, uh, K is the number of parameters that we estimated. That was two for the easy, simplest model and four for the most complex model. And then that turns out to be the AIC. We calculate delta AIC and KQ8. You can see here the best model is model M4, but now the second best model isn't all that much worse. So it's just 0 0.61. AIC units away from the best model. Um, so it's definitely a competitive model. And if you look at the AIC weights here, they are um, more or less the same. So the best model is no, um, not a lot better than the second best. So here in this case, we have quite a lot of what we call model selection uncertainty. Okay, so here this slide really just um, summarizes the results. So here's um, how, how you would, based on this model selection table, how you would uh, interpret your results. So we say model four is best supported by the data. So that means plant height did actually increase with increasing CO2 up to a maximum and um, 
and it's it started to decline again. So that's what Model M4 said. Um, Model M3, however, was also very well supported. So, so, so that means, and I've actually calculated the evidence ratio here. Um, so that means we are not quite sure whether CO2 is actually declining at very high levels or not. So that's a little bit an uncertainty because Model M3 does not include or does not allow for that decline. What we can say for sure is that Model 1 was poorly supported, so it's very unlikely that CO2 had no effect on plant height at all. Okay, so, um, so we saw that there's quite a lot of model selection uncertainty. Now what we could do is we could just go in, look at the best model and look at the parameter estimates, look at the p-values, there's a bit um, yeah, it's tempting to do so, but uh, I just want to say be very careful with that because the standard errors here and, and the p-values are uh, conditional on on this particular model. So this um, these values here, they ignore that we have done model selection and they ignore that there's some uncertainty about which model is the best. So it's best not to um, not to start looking at p-values and report those after you've done a model selection exercise or model selection analysis. So don't, as a rule, um, don't mix model selection and p-values. And, uh, and and why is that? Uh, so you so think about um, taking a, a, a bit of a more naive approach and say, well, you know, I'm just going to fit every model uh, I can think of. So for example, let's assume we are doing a multiple regression analysis. We've got 10 covariates. We could fit all possible models. So that means, you know, um, models that include all possible combinations of predictor variables. And we would end up with more than a thousand possible regression models. So this is uh, each variable could be either in the model or not. And that's even ignoring interaction and polynomial effects. So what I want to say here is that if you sort of follow that um, non-thinking approach, you just you know, bang all the models into the computer, let the computer do the calculations, which, which it might be happy to do you end up fitting a lot of models very quickly. And what, what happens then is that you, you're going to have guaranteed problems with overfitting because what happens now is that one of these models just by chance is going to fit your, da your data very well, but it's actually going to fit to wrinkles, to noise in the data. So it's, uh, it's like putting a thousand monkeys on a typewriter and one of them is going to type just by chance type um, an intelligible an intelligible word and um, and that doesn't mean this particular monkey is cleverer than the others uh, it was just lucky it typed a combination of keys that you recognize as a word and and that's what's going to happen if you just do the unthinking approach of uh, of fitting a lot and lots of models and, and it's related to what I said earlier, so these p-values are actually um, are actually correct only if if you were fitting only this one model. Uh, they are conditional on that model. They don't include the model selection uncertainty. So if you fit the thousand models, you're going gu you're guaranteed to get some models that have um, significant or like predictors with a small p-value. You'd say yes, this is significant, but actually. Um, it is a spurious result. Okay, so then uh, a quick sort of detour about stepwise model selection. Um, I'm hoping a lot of you don't know what that is. Uh, it was earlier taught in stats classes, but it should just not be used anymore. And the reason is very much the same as what we discussed on the previous slide. You end up fitting lots and lots of models, even though you might not be aware of it. The computer, when you do the stepwise model section procedures, the computer in the background fits a lot of models. You're going to get guaranteed spurious results, um, misleading results. Uh, so especially also if explanatory variables are correlated, so just don't do it. Okay, so back to the Acacia crew example. 
So we fitted those four models. We saw that there's quite a lot of model selection uncertainty. And we've also looked at the output of model M4. We saw there are standard errors. And what I wanted to point out here is that we have two sources of uncertainty, which I think you've You've got that point now. So we have the structural uncertainty, which is we do not know which one is the best model. In particular, in this case, there's quite a lot of uncertainty about models three or four being the best. And then we have uncertainty conditional on model structure and that's the standard errors and p-values that, that we looked at. So we've got these two types of uncertainty. And, um, and, and so with that, background, uh, I want to move on to the last section where we talk about model averaging. So how can we, how can we re use those sources of uncertainty to, to give estimates or uh, um, a true reflection of, of all that uncertainty? Okay, so the first thing is that we, we've got these four models and we have each of these models gives a prediction for each treatment here. And you can see those predictions vary quite a bit. So what we could do is, well, we could say, um, if I don't know which model is the best, I could just say, well, let's just average those predictions over the four models. So this is just a simple average here. You can see here we, uh, we sum the predictions and divide by the number of models. So that would mean we give each model the same weight. Now that's not such a good idea because we've seen that um, these models are actually, some of them are better than the others. Um, and so instead what we do is we use a weighted average um, using the Akiki weights. So it's a very simple idea instead of just using um, sort of a, a straight, like a, a normal average, we, we use a weighted average where we use those Akiki weights that we calculated earlier as weights. Okay, again, the calculation of that is really simple. So I'm, I've used, I've generated predictions for uh, 200 ppm here from each model. Um, the first model here predicts 65 uh, centimeters or millimeters, whatever it was, regardless of CO2 level. So it's always 65. Um, and then you can see here, for example, model M4 predicted 38.6 as a, a response. And, and then we've also got those Akaiki weights, those you saw earlier. Now, all we need to do is um, you know, do, do that calculation here. So we, we multiply the weight with the model specific prediction and then sum them up. So. So that's what I'm doing here. So you can see these are really, really very, very simple calculations that you can also do in a spreadsheet very easily. And we end up with 42.1. Okay, so that means our model averaged prediction for 200 ppm is 42.1. And then we can do the same procedure for every treatment here. And, and the results is shown here. So the red lines here are now the the predictions that we got from each individual model. You can see those four models that we fitted. And the blue line is now the model averaged prediction. And you can see that the model average prediction, those predictions are, they fall between those models M3 and M4 mostly because they had by far the highest weight. So they tend to fall there. It tends to fall closely, close to the best model. And uh, in this case, we have two models that are good. And so it's sort of in between. Right, so that's, um, that's our model averaged prediction. So we, um, no, so we, we sort of sidestep the, uh, the issue of having to choose a particular model. We just base our prediction on all the models in the set. Right, but now, what is, what is the confidence interval around these predictions? How certain are we? And you remember there are two sources of uncertainty. So there's the standard error that comes from a specific model. And then there's the uncertainty about which model is the, the best one. So we, we calculated, so these are the averaged uh, estimates that we calculated on the previous slides. Now we need to, 
to to calculate an unconditional measure of uncertainty so an unconditional standard error so this is a standard error that includes both sources of of uh, uncertainty this it's maybe a little bit the daunting looking formula, but actually if you unpack it, it's it's fairly simple. And again, very simple to calculate. So you can do that in a spreadsheet or with a few lines of R commands yourself. So we take, we take the variance. So that's just the standard error squared that we get from each model here. So this is the model specific variance based on model G1. Um, and and then we add so this part dots the, the the variance of the model specific estimate so this is uh, the standard area error that we looked at earlier and then we've got the part dots due to model selection uncertainty so here this is the overall um, averaged mean prediction and then we we look at the squared differences between dot and the model specific um yeah, the model specific predictions. So that, that's these two components. And then we've again got the accuracy weights coming in here. So the the model, the, 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 the better the model, the more uh, its contribution is weighted. Okay. Right, so if we do that for these four models, uh, we've got the model specific confidence intervals here. Um, and you can see here again that same principle. So with the very simple model, we've got relatively narrow confidence intervals, but biased predictions. And then for the more complex model, we tend to have a little bit wider confidence intervals. Um, and now on the right hand side here, you can see the model averaged um, predictions that I showed you earlier. And now in gray, the model, the unconditional confidence interval. So this is calculated using the formula uh, show, that I showed you on the previous slide. And you can see here <clears throat> that the confidence interval is actually a little wider than any and any of the model specific confidence intervals. And that comes back to what I said earlier. So if you look at the standard errors that you get out of a, a, a single model, it doesn't include the model selection uncertainty. Now the model average predictions and more unconditional standard errors do. And you can see that's why it's a little bit wider. And it, particularly in this case here, um, there's quite a bit of uncertainty over to that side. And you can see the confidence interval gets quite wide here. Okay, so uh, last point I want to make. Um, so we've spoken about averaging predictions. And, and that's what I would advocate you do. Um, there are some people who also average parameters and I've done that myself in the past, but there's a pitfall. So you've got to be really careful. And uh, I just want to demonstrate that quickly by looking at model M2 and model M4. So those models look sort of similar. You can see they've got both, uh, got an intercept and then a linear term. And the only difference is that model M4 has got the quadratic term as well. So you can say, wow, okay, we've got beta one in both models. Let's just average these parameters. And, and there are actually the Burnham and Anson book, which is sort of the standard reference seems to suggest that that's a good idea. But if you think about it, um, beta one, in the case of the quadratic model, beta one is actually the slope at the um, at point zero, right? So that's the slope at the intercept, um, and and then the quadratic term determines how quickly the line sort of veers off that straight line. Whereas for the red model here, the slope is um, you know is is sort of the average. Uh, slope across the entire data set. So, so you're comparing things that aren't actually really comparable. So if you compare red beta one to blue beta one, you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. They don't have the same meaning. And the same is true for the intercept. And more generally, if you, um, if you have different models with different predictors in them, they are generally those parameters are not comparable. Um, so, so you have to be really careful. 
uh, there are also situations where you can do it, but um, you you have to be really careful. So what I what I would like to advocate is that you um, avoid averaging parameters where you can, um, and if you want to use model averaging, rather average predictions. Okay, and that brings me to the last slide with some literature. Um, so the standard textbook, um, and that I've really based. I've based my talk and philosophy mostly on this book here by Ken Burnham and David Anderson. Uh, their second edition was published in 2002, Model Selection, Multimodel Inference. And, and I think, um, so it is still the standard um, standard text on, on uh, model selection, multimodel inference. And I very much recommend you read it. Uh, it has really, for me, it has changed my approach to stats and, and science quite a bit. Then um, model averaging specifically. So that's a little bit more a recent stuff. So there's a paper that was published in Ecology by Kate, uh, who, and, and he ex explains why you shouldn't average parameters. And then more recently, there's quite a comprehensive review of model averaging in Ecology. So the Dorman et al. paper also includes a review of Bayesian approaches, information theoretical, and more what they call tactical approaches. So it's very broad, uh, talking about how um, model averaging and, and how you approach it. So they completely only talk about model averaging predictions. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer questions. All right, guys, um, we have one hand up from John. John, you're free to unmute and ask a question. Hi, Rez, thanks. Thanks very much for that talk. I think it's uh, a really nice summary, very succinctly put. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about the, the uh, choice when you have a, a model uncertainty. Yeah. Um, the, the policy that I've adopted previously is to take um, a reductionist view. So basically choose the model with the least parameters when you have something that happens within uh, all data, delta ARCs of each other. Yeah. Um, and that's a sort of Occam's razor idea. Mm -hmm. um, I can see that, that your approach is, is sort of much more mathematical in saying, well, you know, what would the um, outcomes be of the best possible model? But mm -hmm. for most of us, I would say that we're trying to then verbalize the outcome um, in terms of our results and then discuss it um, yeah. in terms of the discussion. I'm not sure whether I get much more advanced in averaging a model mm -hmm. than talking about it verbally <laughs> over, <laughs> over yes. saying, well, yeah. you know, this is my chosen model and mm -hmm. this one's potentially also valid, but I didn't mm -hmm. choose this one. Yeah, look, I, I think that's a perfectly valid alternative. And, um, you know, especially if you've got a relatively clear model selection result, you know, one model is quite clearly better than the other. And, um, and especially if it's also maybe the simpler model that's better than, than the others or that's better than a sort of competing more complex model, then um, I, I think that's perfectly fine. Or sometimes you, I mean, another approach would also be if you have two competing models, maybe they have a very different structure, so you can't really compare the two very easily. You could just say, you know, you could present both models and say, you know, dots, um, those two came up as the best and the data do not discriminate between these two models. That's perfectly fine. I think, um, yeah, I, I think where model selection becomes really, Interesting is if you, so you know, if you need predictions for some reason and you want to be sure that they, you, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You know, you want to, you want to sort of base your inference on, on different lakes, stand on a number of lakes. Then uh, model selection is a is a good alternative, and it's actually not that complicated. So, you know, I, I think in a quick talk like this. Uh, it can look a bit daunting. You see a big f equation on the slide, but actually 
if you sit down and think about it, it's it's really not that complicated. Yeah, I see there are some questions in the chat. Let me uh, see. Oh, there aren't many any more questions. So anyone else yeah. got? Uh, I, I do, if I may. Sure. Sure. Um, I think it related to the to the first point made, but um, yeah, I often have um, multiple top models uh, using a, a cutoff of um, two AIC uh, as well, um, and I often kind of uh, base my inference principally upon the the, the simpler nested variant mm -hmm. uh, of of the two, um, and even if that one kind of has less support than maybe the, the top, like the top model at, um, within uh, kind of a top selection. Is that still okay? Like, I feel like the, the trend has it kind of moved away from that as well. Um, just wondering you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, that's perfectly okay. And let me maybe just quickly share my slides again here. Um, yes, and, and um, there's one thing that both you both said that's really important and not uh, to to choose the simpler model. So if you look if you look at the formula for AIC, um, say you've got a series of nested models, say for example, like with the CO2 example where you've got a linear model and then one with a quadratic trend. Uh, so, so the one with the quadratic trend would just have an extra one extra parameter. So if you if you look at the deviance here, um, if that extra parameter actually has no effect at all, the deviance would stay the same, right? So the model fit would be exactly the same, but you're adding an extra parameter. So that increases AIC by two, <laughs> even, even though that extra parameter has absolutely no effect at all. And, and so, um, so sometimes I think it goes back to Burnham and Anderson. They gave that rule of thumb that uh, within within two AIC units of AIC value, um, you you should consider the models to be um, competitive. But actually, you know, you can easily th there are often situations where you add a parameter without any extra gain, and you still end up you can't actually end up uh, further away than two uh, units. Uh, even if that parameter adds absolutely nothing. And so that's why it's important that if you've got competitive models and they are, especially if they are nested, you you need to choose the, the simpler one. Yeah, so that's... Yeah, that, that's what I tend to do. And especially the null model is then in the top. So I think I, I can mm. assume that the null model has probably the most... Uh, yeah, 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 it's always nested in the others. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the interpre interpretation is still that you... Uh, you know, you, you wouldn't lose a lot of information by adding that extra parameter, but um, yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, that, that's, it's a perfectly valid way of reasoning to say, you know, I've, um, I'm going with the simpler model of these, yeah. Any other questions? We have one from Stefan. Can yeah. It's in the chat there, Stefan. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, okay. Yes. So why not use a, a log transform? Okay. So that's that's actually a very good point. Um, and uh, something I glossed over a little bit. So you, for AIC to be comparable, you need to be sure that the data sets are comparable. So if you if you log transform your um, let's see. Oh, yeah. No, I see you, you're you're saying log transform x. So if you if you were to log transform the the response variable, then the data wouldn't wouldn't be comparable anymore. So that just wanted to make that point. Um, but why why not use the log transform of x? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that would have been a good alternative. I just like those nonlinear models because, you know, often they um, allow you to put in a mechanism that you think is is happening. And um, so, in this particular case, that wasn't that wasn't the case. But um, you now, if you've got uh, a particular 
mathematical model that you wanted to fit and then the parameters really made sense. Like for example, dot saturating curve is actually, it's also known as the type two functional response if you're examining predator to prey interactions. And then you could, then the parameters would have, um, would have a clear biological interpretation like handling time and saturation. What is it? Handling time and attack rate. And so you could directly estimate those. But yes, I mean, often um, so in this particular case, I could have gotten away with just log transforming the X variable. Good point. Good. Any other questions? I think it's two o'clock, so probably reaching the end of, of the slot anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks everyone for listening and um, happy model selection, everyone. <laughs>